Okay, so the recording has started now. We're talking about accommodations, flexible assessment, and supports for autism and learning disabilities today. So we'll start by talking about what is autism. Um, so I want to preface talking about the diagnostic criteria for autism by saying that um, this is looking at autism through kind of one lens, the medical model lens, which um, presents autism through kind of a deficit space. So what are the, what are the social and um, behavioral deficits that a person with autism has that um, may cause them barriers in, um, in the community and in the classroom in our context? Um, and even, even in the language that I'm using to talk about the medical model, you probably hear me talking about barriers and prevention. And those are all looking at autism through another lens called the social model of disability, where um, you know, we think that we say that neurodiversity and um, disabilities of all kinds are just part of human variance. And um, it's not the disability that a person has that um, makes it difficult for them to engage in society, in education, or the workforce, or living, um, or even just access. Um, but it is the um, barriers in the environment that is constructed by able-bodied and neurotypical people um, throughout history that cause barriers for people who are different from accessing the environment. So that's looking at this through a social model. Um, so I want to just preface that by saying I am going to be talking about autism through kind of the medical model through the diagnostic piece, but I'll, I'll weave in pieces of how this can be, um, you know, these are, there are certain barriers that are particularly difficult for people with autism because of some of these um, characteristics or symptoms and the environment. Um, so you may have previously heard about, and, and maybe still do hear people talk about autistic disorder, Asperger syndrome, CDD or childhood disin disintegrative disorder or PDD NOS, which is pervasive de developmental disorder not otherwise specified. So those all are kind of, um, they're old diagnoses that are no longer in existence in the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual through the American Psychiatric Association. So our current version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is the DSM-5. So um, if someone was previously diagnosed with one of these um, conditions, so such as someone who had an Asperger diagnosis, they would now qualify for, they would now be diagnosed as having an autism spectrum disorder. Um, so if someone is going to an evaluation, they're not going to get a new diagnosis of um, Asperger's or autistic disorder or PDD-NOS, they would be diagnosed with ASD or autism spectrum disorders. Um, so this is a lot of people still use the language associated with these disorders that are no longer recognized by the DSM-5. Um, so again, that's kind of the piece of the identity first language that we talked about last week. There are a lot of people who still identify, at, who do identify as um, having Asperger's, um, you know, and that is um, absolutely a way to kind of understand a lot of these um, same things that we're going to be talking about um, that are now kind of officially called autism spectrum disorders. Um, if a person who maybe had one of these disorders or was diagnosed with one of these disorders and um, does not meet the criteria for autism spectrum disorder, they may meet the criteria for a social communication disorder under the DSM-5. So that's um, generally some of the social and communication criteria, but not all of the behavior criteria, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, autism, um, for someone to be diagnosed with autism, they need to meet at least three or all three of the social communication deficit criteria and at least two of the four restrictive and repetitive patterns criteria. Um, so, and again, this is looking like strictly through the medical model. There are, are many individuals, especially adults, who maybe were not diagnosed but identify as having autism, who maybe um, meet most of the criteria but really identify with that community. Um, I was not diagnosed my 
and I'll bring my personal experience into this um, throughout the day as well, but I was not diagnosed until I was an adult. So looking back, I can see um, where all of these, all of the criteria really um, do show up in my uh, infancy and toddlerhood through stories from my family and definitely through um, school age. Um, but then all of them have to be present at the time of diagnosis as well. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that just to give some examples of what these look like. Um, so the, we'll start with talking about the communication and social uh, characteristics of autism. So the first one is a social and emotional reciprocity difficulty. So this can look a lot of different ways. Um, autism spectrum disorders uh, show up very differently in every single person. So um, for some people, but the basic idea of social emotional reciprocity is that someone is um, has difficulty with the back and forths of conversation, um, the responding to social cues, whether that's verbal or nonverbal, um, and a kind of um, connecting with those um, ways that whether it's through speech or nonverbal communication or body language, all of those other um, ways that we reciprocate, it's kind of the take and pull of the conversation. Those are all, um, you know, can show up in different ways. So this may be that someone um, has difficulty responding or knowing how to respond when there's a particular social cue that happens. So for me, sometimes, you know, small talk is really, really difficult because I'm not quite sure, well, what do I say when someone says X, Y, Z? Um, so that's a very common characteristic. And this can also, um, for some individuals, this affects their verbal communication. So some individuals on the autism spectrum have difficulty with verbal communication as well. Um, I know that for myself, when I get extremely stressed, my verbal communication quickly decreases. And um, if I'm in a situation that provokes a lot of anxiety or fear even, um, I have very limited verbal abilities. Um, so that's, you know, especially if it's someplace new that I'm going. Um, so those are some examples about social emotional reciprocity. So you may see those in your students in the classroom. Um, the second, Criteria is nonverbal communication difficulties. So this is being able to read body language, read facial expressions, communicate through um, uh, through any of those gestures and nonverbal cues. Um, so for many, many individuals on the autism spectrum, it's difficult to kind of read nonverbal cues in other people. So um, so someone may not be able to tell what emotion someone is feeling based on their um, facial expression or their body language. They may not be able to tell. Um, so for example, if you are communicating just with your nonverbal communication, so like if you're teaching a class and someone says something that's maybe a little bit inappropriate and you scowl and maybe put your hands on your hips and kind of show that through the nonverbal communication that might not be picked up by somebody on the autism spectrum. They might, it, it is probably going to be more helpful if you clearly address that through direct verbal com communication or through visual representation um, rather than just the nonverbal communication. The last social and emotional criteria is developing and maintaining and understanding relationships. So this can look like, um, for some individuals, um, a difficulty with forming friendships or starting friendships or maintaining friendships over a long period of time. This can also look like, for some individuals, um, sometimes a lack of interest in peers or a perceived lack of interest in peers, which is often related to the other two with kind of a, there's a need and a want for belonging and relatedness and friendships, but there's not necessarily the understanding of how to go about doing that. So that can sometimes look like developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships are difficult. So on the other side, we have restrictive and repetitive patterns and behaviors. Um, so these four criteria um, deal more with the um, behavioral side than the social and communication side. So um, an individual must have two of these four criteria in order to be diagnosed with autism. Um, I'll share with you, I have all four, so I'll, I can give examples of those as well. 
Um, and again, many of these look very different for um, different individuals on the spectrum. So the first is stereotyped or repetitive movements or speech. This is commonly known as stimming. And this can look like um, someone who maybe flaps their hands or um, I, you know, like I sometimes when I get nervous, my eyes will my eyes will twitch a little bit on the one side. Um, I know that a lot of people on the autism spectrum um, will have repetitive speech patterns and um, say the same word over and over again or the same phrase over and over again. Um, I will often ask a question multiple times. That's kind of a repetitive speech pattern that I have. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and those, all those stimming behaviors. So if that's like, um, flapping or uh, looking and touching a certain object again and again and again. Those are all examples of um, stereotyped or repetitive movements or speech. Sameness rituals and routines deals with um, the adherence to sameness and rituals and routines. So this is um, often individuals with autism will have a very specific way they go about um, lots of things they do. And for some people that's most or everything that they do. So um, they may have, you know, particular clothes that they like to wear and those are only the clothes that they will wear or they may have a particular order of doing the steps of a routine. And the key with this one is that um, when the routine or the sameness or the ritual is disrupted, it's very difficult to um, maintain regulation. So um, this can look this can look a couple different ways. So for example, if I was in a class and all of a sudden the professor said, oh, we're gonna go outside today. Let's have class outside today. That would be changing up my sameness and ritual and routine of being in that classroom. And that would probably make me really upset. And I would have to engage in self-regulatory behaviors. Um, probably uh, you would see some stemming and, um, you know, or a student might kind of have a breakdown because they would be really upset by that change. Um, and again, this is not all, all people on the autism spectrum do not have this characteristic and it does look different for every, every single person. Um, but when something changes, that can be really difficult. It can also be difficult for people to transition between tasks and activities. Um, so moving from, you know, a group work to then moving to doing some uh, class you know, classwork at the tables while the professor is lecturing. Transitioning between those activities may be difficult. Um, so we'll talk about some supports that are really helpful for that. Um, but also the sameness rituals and routines can be beneficial to individuals on the spectrum. So if you're providing um, visual schedules and using a routine, using an agenda, those are all things that are really helpful for a lot of individuals on the autism spectrum. Restricted and fixated interests are sometimes called special interests. Um, and these are something that a person is usually particularly um, engaged in even, um, sometimes they're called obsessions, which is usually considered by the autistic community kind of a negative way of phrasing that um, and not very helpful. Um, and many people view their special interests as a positive thing. So for example, one of my special interests is actually talking about autism and talking about disability. And so this actually creates the perfect job for me here at the University of Rochester. But if I'm you know, at a dinner party and somebody brings up something they saw in the news about autism, and then I wanna go off and talk on a tangent about it forever and ever and ever, that may not be considered socially appropriate. And some people um, view special interests as just, again, an extension of the normal uh, range of human variants. And you may say, oh, well, you know, maybe that's not a characteristic of autism. Maybe she's just a really good advocate, or maybe she's just really passionate about that topic. Um, some examples of special interests for individuals may be less common though. So some, you know, I've met children who are super interested in vacuum cleaners or ceiling fans. Um, and then some are very, very common. So some uh, children with autism or adults with autism are really interested in trains or really interested in a particular um, 
like I have, I've had students in the past who were really interested in um, some of the bands at the time, some of the musical groups at the time, and they, their classmates didn't even really notice that that was a special interest of theirs because, um, you know, a lot of the girls in the class were also interested in those things too. So um, again, but this can be difficult for people to um, kind of move away from that special interest when they're talking about it. And um, sometimes that will result in people getting stuck. Um, so again, one of my special interests is gardening. And I know if I'm in the middle of something with my garden, that makes it really, really difficult for me to move away and, you know, start a different activity. Um, or if I'm talking through something, it's very difficult for me to stop talking about that special interest and transition the conversation. So this is, again, kind of related to the other, the sameness rituals and routines. Um, the fourth, whoops, the fourth criteria is um, sensory responsiveness. So an individual can be hypersensitive or hyposensitive to any of the, I'm going to talk about the eight senses today. Um, and so sensory responsiveness means that um, you know, it can be the same for each of the eight senses or it can be different for each of the eight senses or a combination. So someone may be hypersensitive visually. So bright lights might really, really bother them and might um, feel, make them feel very dysregulated and they can't really focus on anything else because the lights are so bright. Um, or they may be hyposensitive and um, they may also be hyposensitive to taste and really crave um, like spicy foods and like lots of textures in their foods. And so, so they might be like chewing gum all the time, or if they don't have access to that, they may like chew on their pencil or chew on other things, chew on paper. Um, and that's that sensory responsiveness that um, under, um, under sensitivity to that particular sense. So again, this can, you can be hyper or hyposensitive to any of these senses. So you're probably familiar with the traditional five senses of sight, visual, um, auditory or hearing, olfactory or smell, gustatory or taste, and tactile or touch. Um, the Star Institute and many occupational therapists also talk about vestibular senses, which are your sense of balance. So someone on the autism spectrum may be, um, or who has a sensory processing disorder, may be hypersensitive to the vestibular sense. So any little um, movement is going to make them dizzy, um, or even like turning their head very quickly can make them dizzy. This is also a characteristic of someone who, um, who maybe has vertigo or migraines. Um, hyposensitivity to the vestibular sense means that there's um, an under responsiveness or a seeking of um, activities that um, promote awareness of the vestibular sense. So this could be someone who really likes or benefits from swinging or spinning. Um, there are, um, you know, a lot of like exercise equipment that's really helpful for this. Um, the next, the, the next sense is the proprioceptive sense. And this is your sense of your body in space um, and an awareness of your body to itself. So that your body awareness. Um, so this is often, um, uh, shown if someone's, um, stomps their feet really hard because they're kind of, you're looking for that input of the impact of your feet into the ground. And then that impacts your feet into your legs, into your knees, into your hips, et cetera. And all of that proprioceptive input and that impact is, um, kind of hyper, excuse me, hype, um, especially sensitive to that um, input. So someone may be seeking that, or they may be really sensitive to that and not like it when there's a lot of input. So they may um, not like to be like when someone goes heavily down the stairs, they may kind of walk much more softly or on their tiptoes. Um, interoceptive is your sense of your internal organs. So if you are hyposensitive, if you're not 
as sensitive to your interoceptive organs. You may not realize if you're hungry, you may not realize if you're in pain, you may not realize if you need to use the restroom. All of those are kind of some of your internal body things that are going on um, that we have to regulate. Um, if you're hypersensitive, if you're extremely sensitive to those, you may think you have to go to the bathroom when you really don't have to go to the bathroom. Or you may think you're hungry and your body is not really in need of nutrients, but you may think you're hungry, so you start eating. Um, you may feel like you're in more pain than, um, than is relative to what your body's experiencing. So all of those, um, all of these eight senses are um, kind of incorporated in sensory processing and sensory processing, if there are some of these difficulties in regulation based on any of these eight senses, um, and someone doesn't meet all the other criteria for autism, someone can still be diagnosed with a sensory processing disorder. Um, so, you know, so these are really important when we're thinking about, um, you know, some of the supports that we provide for our students, like some students benefit from wearing headphones so that they're able to block out some of the external noise. Um, you know, even I've seen, I've had students wear sunglasses to block out some of the external light. Um, chewing gum to satisfy that need for the um, gustatory or the tactile um, piece. Um, so I want to talk about, oh, just one other piece about the diagnostic criteria. So if someone is diagnosed with autism, they're also um, kind of assessed on this, the symptoms being present earlier in life. So again, I, I talked about um, how I wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult. And, um, you know, we had to kind of look back at like um, some family reports to see like, were these present um, earlier in life? And then um, even if they weren't, they may not become fully manifest until, oops, until um, societal demands kind of place more demands on people and things get harder. Um, or sometimes people are diagnosed later in life because they learn to mask and use strategies um, to kind of cover up some of those symptoms. So, you know, um, we could also spend more time talking about masking or camouflaging, um, but many individuals learn to mimic social skills of their peers to kind of um, try to fit in. And then that may cover up some of those autistic characteristics. So this can also look like suppressing stims and suppressing special interests. Um, and in the long term, that creates a lot of anxiety and can lead to depression um, and just stress and burnout for people. Um, there are also ways to teach social skills um, and to teach strategies that can be helpful for someone without having to mask. Um, so it's kind of a balancing of um, you know, when I think about this for myself, I think about this for my students. I don't want to cover up my autism because I'm proud of who I am, but I also know that I need to use strategies sometimes that help me to fit into society and, um, you know, be included in society when we don't live in a fully inclusive society yet, kind of like what we were talking about last week. Um, we also look at whether the... Um, the um, symptoms um, on the previous slide are not better explained by an intellectual disability or a global developmental delay. Sometimes these do co-occur. Um, that's you know fairly common actually for autism to co-occur with an intellectual disability or general developmental disability. Um, and then the um, again, if someone was previously diagnosed under the DSM-4. Um, they typically are going to meet the um, criteria for autism spectrum disorder under DSM-5. And then um, that is always specified with or without intellectual impairment, language impairment, whether it's associated with a known factor. Um, there is no one factor that causes autism. So, um, you know, we look at a variety of genetic factors and environmental factors. Um, and then also, if there's another uh, mental or behavioral or neurodevelopmental disorder. 
Um, so the prevalence of autism as of 2020 was one in 54, and this is based on eight-year-olds being diagnosed. Um, and this is much, this prevalence is much higher in males, one in 38 versus in females, one in 152. And um, this is because most of what we know about autism is based on males and the diagnostic tools are focused on characteristics as observed in boys. So when autism kind of emerged in um, around the 50s and um, it was called autism syndrome in boys, autistic syndrome in boys. And it was really only considered a diagnosis that could be given to boys. Um, so a lot of the data that we have and all the studies are based on boys. And then um, some of these characteristics are more common developmentally at different stages um, in early childhood and childhood development for boys than girls. Um, there is probably an underrepresentation of females diagnosed with autism, especially um, females who have verbal or high verbal skills. And um, I'm going to talk about the differences in neurotypical male and female development um, in um, one study that kind of shows why this might be um, a little bit of a difference. And I do want to acknowledge um, this study, I do not think took into account um, non-binary students. So I'm not sure what the statistics on um, the developmental scores in this study would be for um, representing non-binary students. However, students with autism and um, children and young adults with autism spectrum disorders are more likely to identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community than um, non-disabled peers. Um, so, and that could be because um, sometimes individuals with autism are um, less likely to um, put up those masks if they may be more likely to be okay with coming out than some of their non-disabled peers. Um, but there, you know, there are a lot of reasons why that could be, and that's an area that is definitely needs future and more research to kind of um, look at the link between those intersection intersectional identities between um, LGBTQ plus autistic individuals. Um, so just looking at this um, kind of uh, early childhood um, scores of uh, on a friendship questionnaire, which was kind of one social skill measure, um, typically developing males are represented by the triangle here on the left, and typically developing females are represented by the triangle here on the right. So you'll see that typically developing females scored higher on this one measure than their typically developing male peers. Um, so this can show us in this study that girls may have developed some of these friendship questionnaire skills that were measured earlier than, their, than the boys in their classes. And the same is true um, on this chart for boys and girls with autism. Those are represented by the um, dark circle on the chart. But you'll also notice that girls on the autism spectrum are at, this, are at roughly the same scores as boys without autism spectrum disorders. So if you have all of these people in your classroom and you know you have a typically develop a bunch of typically developing girls and typically developing boys, your girls with autism spectrum disorder who may be having some of the same social skills as their male counterparts without autism, you may, they might kind of fly under the radar. You could see how that would happen in a, in a K-12 setting um, or any setting um, when this is kind of going on. So we're, you know, teachers and um, practitioners are more likely to notice autism in um, boys at that young age. So that kind of also speaks to the discrepancy with um, the diagnosis. Um, in 2020, this was the first time that um, black and white children were um, diagnosed at the same rate. Um, and Hispanic children were still underreported as being diagnosed with autism. And black and brown children are still identified later in life than their white counterparts. So um, 
this speaks to a lot of issues. We know that there are inequities in healthcare um, regarding race. So that prevents people from getting diagnostic evaluations. Um, there may be other factors going on. Um, again, um, inequity and poverty in housing and community supports um, in our um, communities also prevent um, healthcare access. So that may be one reason why um, some of these um, rates are different among different communities. So this is just another area that needs to be um, addressed is to provide both diagnostic and support resources for black and brown families with um, individuals with ASD so that um, we can start to rectify some of those inequities. So I talked a little bit before about person first versus identity first language. So both are ways that are appropriate to talk about individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, and it depends on the person's preference. So some individuals prefer to use person first language and some prefer to use identity first language. With other disabilities, um, a lot of other disabilities choose to use person first language. So um, for example, someone who has a learning disability rather than a learn I'm a learning disabled student, that would be um, probably not the person's preference, but with autism and with the deaf community, those are um, often communities that some people do identify with identity first language. So the difference is whether, um, you know, the word autistic comes after the person or before the person's um, identity. So person first language looks like I have autism, a person with autism, a student with autism, or someone on the autism spectrum. Identity first language looks like I'm autistic, an autistic person, an autistic student, or an autistic self-advocate. So those are just some examples. Um, so what does this look like in practice for us as educators and as um, people on a college campus? So the bottom line is that instruction and skill acquisition are related. We know that. But if skills are not being acquired, if a student is not successful in our classroom or in our campus setting, we need to change the environment and we need to change our instruction to support them better. So um, the structure is really important, providing a lot of structure, providing a logical sequence and focus of goals, um, clear communication, and building communication skills, opportunities for practicing communication skills, providing direct instruction um, is extremely important. So teaching, um, teaching directly is often more helpful for individuals with autism spectrum disorders than kind of an inquiry based. And having clear expectations is really helpful too. So even um, you know, if you are interviewing someone, providing the interview questions ahead of time for them is a great strategy that may help support someone um, in having that direct language ahead of time. Um, we also want to teach to generalization. So just because someone can do a skill in one setting doesn't mean that they can do it in another setting without us without support. Um, so for example, when I work with students on on um, uh, asking for their testing accommodations or reminding teachers about their testing accommodations, we usually kind of practice that in a smaller setting and, you know, practice like, oh, what would you say? You know, oh, I need to take my test at the testing center. Can I go to the testing center? Um, or, you know, here's the email that we're going to practice sending to your professors at the beginning of the semester. Um, but then when the semester actually comes, we have or when that situation actually comes, it's helpful to practice that in the situation where it's going to happen. So whether that's walking over to the classroom or talking to the professor one-on-one -on -one ahead of time um, or drafting up an email together before sending it. Um, so those are all kind of things that are really helpful where students, um, neurotypical students may be able to generalize some of those skills automatically. It's often something that um, autistic individuals need a little more support with. Um, I also want to talk about focusing and sequence of goals quickly because um, we want to make sure that our goals have a purpose. So a worthwhile goal is a good goal. And 
So I say this because, you know, I think about our learning objectives and I think about we want to be um, rigorous in our instruction and we want to make sure that um, we are meeting all of our course objectives if we're um, teaching. And so the course objectives don't have to change, but the way that we get there, the way that we get students there can change. So I, I like to tell this story. I had a student who was in... Um, in late elementary school. And for the last couple of the past few years, he had had a goal in his IEP, his individual education plan, that he was gonna learn how to tie his shoes so that he could put on his shoes independently. And so he had definitely made some progress, but was not quite there yet. Still needed a little bit of help to tie the knot in his shoelaces. And so eventually, you know, I sat down with him and I was like, why are we, you know, what about Velcro shoes? You know, you want to be able to put your shoes on independently, and that's the goal. The goal is not that you have the fine motor skills to manipulate a shoelace. The goal is that you can put on your shoes by yourself. So adjusting that goal was really, really helpful for him. Then he was successful with just a little bit of a different tool, using the Velcro shoelace, the shoes instead of the shoelace shoes. Um, I use this example a lot of times when I talk about giving calculators to students. Um, if a student is you know still struggling with um, some of the memorization of facts or even formulas and they can do that they can still complete the math or the engineering or the science tasks with a calculator rather than having to rely on their mental math um, why not provide them with a calculator that's a tool that we're going to be able to provide for students to build to promote independence so i think that's just really important to talk about um, I want to briefly talk about learning disabilities and then we'll kind of break for some questions today. Um, so I have a couple different, there are many different types of learning disabilities, and they're usually based on the specific area of processing that is affected um, by the learning disability. So for example, dyslexia is a difficulty with processing reading and language. Dysgraphia is a process, is difficulty with processing writing or with, um, with the writing process. Dyscalculia is the difficulty processing math and numbers. Dyspraxia is difficulty with fine motor and sensory integration. And then executive functioning often accompanies many learning disabilities or it can be, um, there can be this just in and of itself with difficulties with attention or organization or other executive functioning skills. When we um, meet in two weeks, um, we're going to talk a little more in depth about executive functioning because this is a really big area that um, a lot of college students struggle with, not just college students with disabilities. So um, we're going to talk about how to promote executive functioning in two weeks when we meet. Um, and I linked this website here, um, Understood, that has um, K-12 examples, but some of the older high school examples I think are really applicable to what we do in the higher education space. So you can kind of hear children talking about um, how their learning disabilities affect them and what it is like. I really, really like the ones on attention and organization. They just do a great job explaining how that um, kind of shows up for them. Um, so we will save talking about supports and accommodations for two weeks from now because I want to make sure we have time for questions. I will just briefly go to the slide at the end so you can see um, my contact information and I'll drop the slides into the chat and I will also send them out with the recording. Um, so you can always contact me for more professional development for your department or your um, your um, staff group specifically. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with me if you want me to help you with a particular course or a particular um, area that you would like to provide um, more accessible options for. Um, and I have the transition opportunities at the UR website and the Office of Disability Resources website here as well. So I'll stop sharing there. Thank you so much. And I welcome any questions or comments that you have in our last 12 minutes. And if there's no comments or questions, I can start talking about supports today. 
Okay, let's do that then. I'll share my screen again. And let me just drop the um, slides in the chat. I meant to do that beforehand. So those are loading in the chat for you right now. So you have your own copy of the slides. All right, I will go back to the slideshow and we will continue with talking about supports. Okay, so we've talked about um, a couple different types of disabilities that students may have. And now I wanna talk about how we can support them in the classroom. So some great ways to support students um, and these are things that you can apply in your classroom to all students to just make your classroom more accessible. Um, so it doesn't have to be that you're directing this support towards one particular student with a disability, but it can be something that you incorporate all the time. Um, so modeling and self-talk are great ways to um, build really any skills. I think this can be really helpful for content, but it can also be helpful for um, for social skills, for social emotional skills, self-reflection, self-advocacy skills. So I will often talk through what I'm thinking um, or do like a think aloud strategy while I'm doing a problem on the board or while I'm thinking through a, thinking through problem solving for even practicing um, breaking down a project. So, you know, if I pass out my syllabus in class, and then, um, you know, I'm going over the syllabus and I get to the page where there's the final project in the syllabus that can be a little overwhelming. Right. So I, I would talk through that with my students. I would say, you know, I'm thinking that I'm going to really need to break this down because I'm a little overwhelmed by this big project. So one strategy that I would use for that is first to recognize that I'm a little overwhelmed by the big project sit with that emotion and then I'm going to try to think about how I can break that down into smaller chunks and I'm going to write it out in my agenda um, in this, this way. So using that um, self-talk and modeling and think aloud can be really helpful. Providing um, directions in both written and verbal um, ways and visuals if you can um, is really helpful. So um, this is why, you know, providing an agenda, not just telling students what you're going to do for the day, but writing the agenda on the board or having a handout or having a slide up is really helpful. Um, this can also be helpful when you're doing um, tasks with students. So if they have to work in groups on completing a task, having the directions broken down and um, into a written and visual way and then also talking through it. Using graphic organizers is really helpful for a lot of content. Um, questioning strategies, so thinking about um, both closed-ended questions where students can um, respond um, to the question with just one word, like a yes or a no question, and then also open-ended questions that kind of promote more thinking and um, get students doing some more critical thinking so that they can apply their learning in a little bit of a different way. And um, again, that can boost communication too by thinking about your your questioning strategies. I talked about direct teaching of generalization already. So that's a great, a great strategy to support all of your students. Providing wait time is really important. So this is helpful for students who are processing um, difficulties, and that can be students with any of the disabilities that we've talked about today and other students. Um, so information processing can take time longer for some students than others. And um, if we even practice this by, you know, if you ask a question to the class and then call on someone after a little bit of a wait time, even if it's just a couple seconds, it feels like a long time. But um, that can really provide some time for information processing to happen for your students who might not be able to participate if they um, weren't given that wait time. And, you know, I have been told in um, some when I've been observed by like faculty advisors and things like that, that I am the queen of wait time. So I will sit there and, you know, be OK with that silence, which just takes practice. Um, but especially if you ask a complex question or ask students to reflect on something and, you know, before asking them to respond back out loud or before asking them to talk to their partner about it, um, just providing a lot of wait time. And, you know, you can even sit there, let them tell the 
12, you're gonna provide wait time. So I'm gonna ask this question that I'm gonna um, ask you to think about it for 30 seconds before I have somebody answer. Um, providing visuals and manipulatives can be really helpful. So this can be through pictures. Um, this can be through tools that help us to do hands-on practice with our content. Um, this can even be through um, visuals that have like a little picture next to each item on the agenda to um, have a visual kind of tie down that helps to support that comprehension. Repetition is super important. Um, thinking about ways that we can um, we can um, support students by multiple um, repetitions of content. So um, teaching in the same thing in multiple different ways, coming back to it a week later, coming back to it two weeks after that. Um, checks for understanding are really important. And we'll talk more about this with executive functioning. But checks for understanding means that you're um, checking in with students and not just saying, do you understand and waiting for the nod or the head, you know, the head nod or the yes answer, because students can do that even if they don't understand. But checking for students to um, say back the instructions in their own words or to teach you back the content in their own words, um, that really shows that they understand what they're supposed to do. Um, and this is super helpful, I think, for giving direction. So if you're, you know, in a class and you're about to you know, go off and send the students into their groups to do something, checking for understanding, having someone say, you know, oh, can someone say to the whole group, can someone repeat what we're supposed to do? Can someone explain to the whole group what you're supposed to do in your groups today? Really great strategy. Um, incorporating self-reflection and self-evaluation. Um, we'll talk more about that with assessment next time we meet too. Using de-escalation strategies, so not reacting if there's um, behavioral needs in your class, but um, or if, even if someone blurts out or something um, small like that, um, but promoting self-regulation strategies and modeling those yourselves as well. So there are lots of strategies that kind of fall under this. So like even things like taking deep breaths or um, doing... Uh, mindfulness activity. Um, you know, I model those with my students. When I work with them, we usually start class with a one minute activity that, you know, doesn't take long, but um, that models that, you know, kind of bringing us back down to baseline before we engage in the content. Because if students are escalated, if this is true for any of us, if we're escalated, if we're not regulated emotionally, we're not going to be able to engage in the content in something more complex that's, you know, that's just, um, the order of our needs need to be met um, that appropriate way. I highly recommend doing open book and untimed tests and assessments. Um, you know, I think we think about, oh, we have to prepare students for the real world when we're in college. But you don't really have to sit down and do a time test very often in the real world. So, you know, for example, this presentation I had a couple of weeks to prepare it. And, you know, I could take my time and take breaks and, you know, do all those things. I could use my resources, right? I definitely looked stuff back up before I put it on the PowerPoint. And, um, you know, that's true for almost all of our fields. So I highly recommend that for assessments. Allowing students to use fidgets, gum, to let them multitask if that helps them to focus. Using social stories is a great way to um, incorporate uh, social skills and um, social emotional um, building and community building. So social stories are often based around a specific situation and um, it kind of walks through um, what happens in that situation and you can have the student put themselves in the situation. So I do this like preparing a student for a transition. So like if there was a field trip in one of the classes, I might create a social story for the student and say like, okay, you know, on Friday, and, and I would do this with visuals. So I'd have like a page that, you know, says on Friday, we're going to the science museum. And, you know, that would be like the name of the social story. So we'd say, okay, we're going to walk into the classroom and we have to bring our water bottle. We have to bring our backpack. We have to bring our ID. And then, you know, pictures of all of those things. And then we go to the classroom and then we get on the bus and we walk from the bus to the science museum after we get to the parking lot. Um, you know, just kind of walking through all those things ahead of time to prepare the student for that um, 
particular social activity. And then the last one that I'll end with today is just providing student choice. Um, this is so, so important um, to provide choice with um, all the things that we do. You know, we're, we think about ourselves and we're not motivated if we're not involved in the choices that we make, right? If someone decides for us, we don't, we don't always want to do something. And, um, you know, so thinking about self-determination theory, which I know a lot of you are familiar with here at University of Rochester, that, um, you know, that autonomy, relatedness, and competence go together. And the autonomy to be able to make your own path is really, really important and um, can help students be engaged and can help students feel like they're supported in your classroom. And um, also provides different ways for them to access content that may be more successful for them than the ways that we originally prepared. Um, so I'll talk more about that in two weeks when we do um, talk about accommodations and flexible assessment and some more supports for executive functioning. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here today. Um, and I'll stay on for a minute if anybody has questions. Um, otherwise, I hope to see you next week at the Warner Talk. And um, if not, maybe in two weeks for our last session um, in this series. As always, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you.